Hello, everyone. I love that image, don't you? I kept it there intentionally so that uh, people are wondering what happens, but that's MC Escher, and he's a mathematician and uh, an awesome illustrationist. He's got a staircase which never ends. And of course, because it's impossible, I said it's a fitting image to the start of our talk. Well, golfers are the theme of the day, right? So I said, why not add some more photos there about it? Now, the idea of this talk is to not test your Go skills, but ensure that you have at least a what the hell just happened moment, <laughs> right? You're going to see code snippets. We're going to run some actual code, uh, should see, which is seemingly impossible, but that's not it. These are all examples that I have actually collated with real life uh, goof ups and examples. So people, when there was a situation where there was unexplained piece of code, so we'll try and understand why it happened and how it happened. And along the way, we'll have some fun. Now, if uh, I don't want the talk to be too heavy, so I'm also going to talk about, I'm sure you're looking at that last slide, what? Uh, I'm going to talk about a few confessions as an entrepreneur. And a uh, little bit about me. My company's name is Josh, not Josh. There is no Josh in my company. I co-founded this company 12 years ago. I've been programming for about 20 years, and I do believe that programming is an art. Uh, my company works exclusively in uh, Ruby and Go, and then of course we have to support all React and uh, native Android, iOS. I had the privilege of authoring a couple of books, and I should also put out a few disclaimers. Yeah, my first confession, this is Anuj, she's also been the co-author of this talk, and uh, the confession is that, you know, I'm almost twice as old as he is, nobody heard that, uh, but I have no qualms in going to him and asking to review my code. All right, and uh, these are all the things that we've learned. The bottom line, the takeaway from this talk is, read the specifications. The Go specifications, document specifications, are amazing. The problem is, they're super concise. Every word, one additional word, and suddenly it's a gotcha moment in realizing, oh, is that how it is? So, are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready? Yeah. Okay, so I'll start, I'll build up the tempo slowly, and we'll start looking at some easy, simple examples. The problem with such, giving such a talk is that I have a complete varied audience. Now, there might be somebody who is very new to go. There are people who've been there and probably thinking, what is this joker talking about the stage? It's obvious. But if every one of you all has at least one moment where it says, aha, my aim is achieved. Are you ready? Yes. Yes. Simple shit first. All right, I have an array of eight elements. I'm taking a slice out of it. And I won't ask you all what this is. This is, this is the slice and this is the array, am I right? Yes, I'm right. <laughs> so far, so good. I'm going to do some simple things just to warm up, uh, get, your, get your minds churning. I've manipulated the slice. What's the expected output? What's the manipulation of the slice in the array? Do both change? Yeah, both change. Why? Because the slice is, a, is peeking into the array. Let's, what happens now? I'm appending to the slice. What happens, is it, is it a new slice getting created? Is the same array getting changed? Both change, well done. So the array gets manipulated, the slice is changed. Let's push this a little more. What happens now? So for, I'm hoping people have understood the syntax there. It's just a, the flat array. I'm inserting three elements on the trot. Why should it be different from the previous one? So, yeah, so here's the case, right? It's obvious. Hey, the slice changed, the array didn't. Now, 
if a few of you all have had one of these moments, smile. OK, a lot of you all smiled. Uh, let's, let's dig a little deeper into this. And I'll go fast on this part, because you all know Go. This is how, how Slice is. Uh, it's a struct which has the length, the capacity, and it's a pointer into the array. Note that the capacity of the slice is 5. Why 5? Because that's the length of the array. And when I manipulate something, it's automatically manipulating the same memory space. When I append something, it's, up it's manipulating the array. However, when I added three more elements, it's crossed the capacity. So the slice reallocates the complete copy of this. Now, what is the problem you see in this? Your code is working fine for some time, and suddenly you realize that, hey, something's gone wrong. The take home from this part is that you want to be very sure when you're working with an array and then slicing off it. Because you're going to be, you're going to end up in a state where your array is completely manipulated sometimes, and your slice keeps working. So your slice is working fine and your array isn't. So beware of these uh, slice and array wars. So y'all, if y'all are warmed up, let me detox y'all. All right. That this is, uh, you know, all the stars that you see out there? They're the, the confessions of an entrepreneur. Uh, I started in 2007, with me and my co-founder, only two of us, right? And I knew only one thing in life, how to code. Now, there were so many people who came and dissuaded us from starting up, citing various reasons that, you know, a larger company requires finance skills and management, and you have to give up coding. And you have to look into the sales and marketing and uh, where's the money? And uh, we were worried. We were scared. But to put out a few other myths, I had I have just a basic college education qualification, but a passionate programmer. Uh, I didn't have any connects or contacts in higher places who could bail me out and give me some work. And moreover, I didn't have any money because uh, I started after eight years of programming, and uh, well, it's a pretty well-paying job. But why didn't I have any money? Because uh, I have funded a lot of pubs in my local city back home in Pune. <laughs> so you used to only go party three times a week. But that's not counting the weekends. So <laughs> uh, yeah, well, and I can, I can put that to a test. It's helped me out, right? We can meet in the post-conference party, and we can test that theory out. <laughs> Uh, but what we did have was passion. My company's name is Josh. And Josh, in my mother tongue, Hindi, means enthusiasm and passion. And that's why we started this company name, because as a programmer, what is your toughest job? Naming functions. <laughs> <laughs> so we said, hey, man, this is all we can do. Let's just do only this. OK. Today, after 12 years, uh, we have about 106 programmers working in Ruby or Go. We have about 85 clients. The passion is still strong. I didn't want to mix uh, services with a product. I'm sure there are plenty of entrepreneurs, uh, been there, done that entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs, failed entrepreneurs, and the people in the audience who feel, I will start up one day. If you're one of them, my sincere advice is, do not try to mix the two. Don't try to fund your product by the services you are rendering. You'll probably mess it up. So what we've done is we've actually started putting out separate companies every time we have a product idea. One is in the insure tech space. One is an IoT smart metering company. One is in the retail space. One is in the online car auctioning space. And we invest in these companies. So it's a good medium to actually diversify, enjoy the way you're think building things, and yes, I have already shut down two companies of these products which didn't work. But nothing, I repeat, nothing works without passion. And if you are passionate about something and you're following that up, success is about guaranteed. I'm keeping my fingers crossed because uh, every year I lose more hair. So I, I don't know what happens when I lose all my hair. <laughs> well, back to business. Are you ready? All right, all of you all, the answers to these uh, next few slides are either true or false. 
What say? And if you have an opinion, it's always awesome to shout out loudly. True? False? False, false, true. Well, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> it's a compiling error. And this is, this is, all of you all have been through this. It's, it's a compiling error because even though the value of the integer through the type or through the native int is 12, Go is going to look at them as different types. So it will not even allow you to compile because in, uh, for all Go programmers, there is only one way to do things right, and that's the only way it will allow you, unlike other languages. Here's a funny story. You know, I've been the, I, used to give a lot, I have been giving a lot of talks at Ruby conferences where I make exactly the opposite statement. Where in Ruby, you can do the same thing in 10 different ways because it's a human language. You know, it's fun to do things in different ways. And when I'm talking Go, it's like, hey, there's only one right way to do things. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, I'm a salesman. <laughs> well, look at the slide. And let's try to push the limits a little more. I'm doing the same thing with a struct. I have a type foo struct, because I like foo. Uh, and I have an anonymous struct. And I'm going to compare the two. The data in the struct is absolutely right. I am 18 years old. right? And uh, the data is the same. The values are the same. The type, one is a struct type, named type, and one is an anonymous struct. What's the output? True, false. True? If you think it's true, shout out loudly. True. true. If it's false, false. Uh, that doesn't mean that side shouts, right? It just, just think. Yeah. Compiling errors, anyone? Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Aim achieved. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, somebody got it right. Yes, this is true. Because uh, only for a struct, Go is going to look at the internal native types to, and check them carefully. Let's push it further. I'm doing the same thing. Oh, T-shirt on this one. So I have these T-shirts, a few of them available. All right, let's see who gives the answer. Uh, a strict, strong, confident, proud answer gets a T-shirt from me. All I have done is just put them out into another method to compare the same data. Elephant. It doesn't have to be right, just that it has to be strong and confident. Ah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should talk. <laughs> Elephant's the right answer. <laughs> yes. Anyone? False. False. And uh, the t shirt yours, if you're able to answer, tell me why it's false. Yes. Perfect. So here's the kicker. The interface data type checks the dynamic type of the underlying struct. So at this time, it looks at foo and an anomalous, and it's a struct. So it's false. Subtle things which uh, get our blood boiling, doesn't it? All right, the other way. Let's try the reverse way on this now. The answer to this riddle is true, but my data is different. But my data is different. What's the magic code here? And sir, please come and meet me after the talk and collect your teacher from me. And what's the magic code here? Any takers? How? You'll have all seen the underscore being used. We use it very often, right? Oh, damn, that's an error. I don't want to handle it, underscore. You remember? The blank field. You put a blank field. You, typically, a blank field in a struct is going to be used when you want to pad the structure for mostly transmissions for any kind of protocol, buffers, stuff like that. But it is not compared. Now, here's the cool part. This is there in the specifications. And it's, it's very concisely put a struct will compare all the fields except non-blank fields. 
How often do you end up reading? You know, it's a common myth that when you read a sentence, you tend to skip three out of the words there, and yeah, you know the meaning because you're just looking up the, picking up the context there. The Go documentation, ladies and gentlemen, please read it extremely carefully because every word has a meaning in it. This bit us a lot somewhere, and we were wondering why this thing is not working. Okay. Let's continue the game. True, false? Hey, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the googly. And I had promised, I promised Mark backstage that I am not going to talk about how England won the Cricket World Cup, but not the final. <laughs> right? And the googly just brought back all the memories. But yeah, this is straightforward, right? Everyone knows this. Uh, what about this? False? True, true, anyone? Well said, this is a compiling error. This is a compiling error. So slices, maps, functions cannot use the equality operator because they are not direct, they are, all, they are indirected because they are structs internally and they have pointers in there. Quick check with you for the rules here. All these rules are actually examples that have been done in the past here. For the type, the types must match except when it's a struct where you're comparing the struct fields. All the values must be identical except the blank fields. Maps, slices, and functions, Go will not dereference it. So it's one level check. This is the reason why uh, type checks in Go are super fast and accurate. Unlike languages uh, in the past, like Java, it'll go with type inferencing all up the hierarchy to see if there's genuinely the type. And go down, drill down to the native data type and check it, which slows things down. The only exception is the interface data type, where it will do the first level check on the dynamic type. OK. Warmed up? Are you all warmed up? OK. You know what? When you talk about comparisons, I have to detox again. And I have to confess about my life's failures. Uh, you know, when, when you have started up, and I'm sure there are how many entrepreneurs in the crowd here who've, who've started up, right? I'm sure you've always had a problem of no money, right? This had been a time. Uh, my time was September 2010. We had $8 in our account. We had to pay salaries at about $7,000, $8,000. I go, I have no option, like I told you, I had no savings, I had nothing. So we go to the bank and say, we will take an unsecured loan. And the banks are like, yeah, sure, man. <laughs> Come, we'll give you an unsecured loan. I'm like, yay, somebody is supporting us. What a fantastic economy, the banks are our friend. And he comes back with the document a week later and shows me, I'm like, hey, dude, uh, the, the rate of interest you, when we spoke, you said it is uh, like about 12%. Uh, now you just showed it to like 17%. I mean, that's not fair. Like he looks at me in the eye. This is banker's story. He looks at me in the eye and like, uh, yes, sir, I agree. But uh, it is going to take us two weeks to change the documentation and get back to you. But uh, will your company survive till then? So I took the paper, signed it, gave it back to him and said, don't ever come in front of me again. But that's, people are going to let you down. Your finances, your banks are definitely going to let you down. That money actually got us out of the hole and uh, life was good after that. We were able to actually sustain, get some more customers. So this, every time you hit that one deciding factor where you want to sit down, hold your head, Pull out the rest of your hair, right? Just hang on, <laughs> just hang on. <laughs> there is always there. Well, your customers are going to let you down. We had a case where our customer is, uh, you know, you're a startup. You're always going to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I definitely want to do, okay, my payments are delayed by a month. And one more month. And after three months, I got an email. Hey, uh, you know what? Uh, we've declared bankruptcy. You can keep the source code. 
I'm like, dude, I'm, <laughs> what do I do with the source code? It's not toilet paper for me. He's like, yeah, uh, but we've gone bankrupt. But the weird part was, bankruptcy in the US is weird. You could be super rich, but your company could go bankrupt. So this guy's living in a mansion in the hill with uh, a fancy cars and a swimming pool, but is refusing to help us survive. So your customers are going to let you down. Be prepared for it. Hell, you can, you know, your banks will let you down, your customers will let down people, even your team let you down. Now, who here has deleted a production database? But before deleting the production database, as a good developer, you deleted all the backups first. <laughs> Because hey, there's too much of there's too much of backups. I'll first delete all the backups, then I'll back up the production. And by mistake, oops, there goes the production database. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> we did it, and then we were um, we were tested for our limits of trying to how long can we stay awake. So my my capacity was seven days. So you're in the office for seven days and nights trying to restructure that data from the logs. People. We, we take logging so lightly sometimes. Those logs will come and save your ass one day. <laughs> Log everything. <laughs> now, a question might pop up. What happened to that developer who actually deleted the production database? We gave him a raise and fixed the process. That guy is still with us after like uh, 12 years. He's still with us. And uh, one, of the, one of the most efficient, reliable developers in my company. Everyone makes a mistake once in a life. The question is, as an entrepreneur, can, do you have the ability to respond? If you just split the words, responsibility, into the ability to respond, you may not be right. But did you take a decision is all that matters. This, this simple mantra has uh, helped me out a lot over the years, where it does not matter whether you've taken the right decision, lost a client, I had a customer whom I was trying to tell them why you should not work with an RDBMS and you should work with a NoSQL database because this is how, this is the right approach for your particular product. And he tells me, dude, uh, but my friend tells me that we should use MySQL, oh sorry, SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server. And like, dude, you have open source tools for this. Please don't use an RDBMS, it'll be easier. No, 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 my friend. And I said, dude, it's the my way or the highway. And my customer said, okay, highway. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oopsie. <laughs> but <laughs> the question was taking a decision and sticking by it. A lot of the times, if you're going to back down, we are probably going to end up with the situation where uh, you're going to tell your customer, I told you so. But that has no value later on. So respond and have the ability to respond, and you're probably in good shape. OK, back to business again. Only this time, I'm going to actually run the code. Any takers for the output? So I'll just explain this. This is just a, it's a map. And I'm just printing the map. That's all I'm doing. What's going to happen? I'm a Wim user, OK? I have always used Wim, and I've tried to use everything else, and I always just come back to Wim. Is this visible? OK? All right. <laughs> I've always come back to Wim. So I'm going to run this code. And it prints. Prints the output. So far, so good. Uh, all I'll do is I'll run this program again. Have you noticed that the output is different? Right? Why? Because, no, is, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that clearly, but did you mean that it intentionally randomizes the order? <laughs> so here is where uh, I come up with the concept of programming ethics. The language will intentionally randomize the order so that as a programmer you don't rely on the insertion order when you're, use, when you're iterating, a, iterating a map. 
Uh, most languages, I've seen this. I've seen this in Ruby where the, where the map, the, the hash is actually, uh, the order is maintained. So the unfortunate, uh, you know, bad coding practices come in, like when in doubt, just use a map because you can treat it like an array. You iterate the map, it's in the, you iterate the map, you'll get it in the same order, and then you look it up, you get whatever you want. So when in doubt, just use a hash. That's wrong. Go tells you that if you're going to use a map, you're supposed to use it for a lookup. So in case you need to iterate it, ensure that as a programmer, you are not depending on the insertion order. And this brings up a lot of other concepts in Go where it is trying to tell you there is one way of doing things, do it right. Okay. Some more code? Ah, there's a t-shirt there. Would this code actually work? We know, I know all of y'all know that uh, method overloading or function overloading is not supported in Go. So, for, I'm pretty sure there are a few folks of you who already know the answer here. You will get your t-shirt, but hold the thoughts. This is the, this is the piece of code that I, uh, the snippet that we just saw. I'm creating a person with different number of parameters. Should it work? Yes. Yes. It should work. How many of y'all think it'll just, is a compiling error here. So it's the same method being called with different parameters. That code actually works. And this code is working with uh, all the default values that are put in for those globals. Now is the time. Hold, hold it, you know the answer. People who know the answer, raise your hands. Awesome, okay. If the rest of y'all are thinking, what just happened? It's a win, but this is a very interesting concept. All right, uh, there's somebody here who actually, you sir, you had, what's, what, what'd I do? Okay. But the data types, for name, age, height, and weight are of different data types, so they're not strings. No interfaces. So there are no interfaces here? No strings, yes. No strings. Yeah, it is a very, it is a very addict function, of course, because I have multiple number of parameters, but what am I doing? Uh, no. No reflect. No reflect, no type assertion. I'm not using, I'm not parsing strings by the name and trying to evaluate it. Anyone? I'm sorry? I, no, it's, it's go. <laughs> so you, it's not a slice here. <laughs> so even if I take it in a slice, it still means, so that, that's what it means by variadiac function. But the question is there of different data types too. So it's a slice of what? Interface data type? No. There are easier ways to do this. Yes, sir? Uh, variadic? Uh, it cannot be variadic for each type, otherwise things like this would fail. This is a string, this is an integer. Yes, this is new person is a method. Is the same method. Yes, sir. Agreed, but I've done something even different. There is no, it is a very addict function, agreed, but there are no interfaces, no interface data type used in this code. If it was an, uh, it does the same thing. If you use an anonymous struct, it still doesn't help 
because I've passed different variables. No. <laughs> new, met, new person is a method. That's a good question. New person is not, it's a, it's a method. Yes? This, this is the only struct I have in the entire code. There are no there are no constants in this code. <laughs> you you parse it and iterate it and see if the string is the same name? No. <laughs> My order is different too. You the man. All these are functions. You got yourself a t-shirt. Here's the code. Here's the code. Where I have a very act function, it's perfect. But I'm taking I'm taking a function as a very act function, and I'm returning this. All right. But I had told you all earlier that, uh, see, this is, this is an easy way to just have some fun, right? <laughs> I have told you all that all these examples are from practical, practical shit that we have been through. <laughs> so where would this actually work? Functional options. Functional options or functional parameters are actually a very neat, cool way to have different types of configurations everywhere. For example, if I want to initialize a server with TLS or with a timeout, I can just specify them. If you all have looked at the config struct in most packages, you would see that that config struct is huge and you have to set every field there. Uh, if it's a nil field, it's parsing involved. These are easier ways to do it. So if you actually set up the defaults for a new server, you can choose which option to override just by passing a function. So you can even pass it parameters. This is an easier, better way to do this. Uh, Dave Cheney actually gave an entire talk in .go a few years ago on uh, functional options. And I actually had gone down there and asked him, like, dude, why didn't Go just support uh, default parameters? <laughs> Were they equal to and stuff in most languages? Any takers to answer that question? Why, are now, why don't it, most languages now started supporting default parameters with an equal to, right? When you're declaring the method. It's a nightmare for parsing that code and guaranteeing that it's always done right. The complexities of your parser in your compiler is insane. Uh, so the decision was taken not to support it. Be sweet, be simple, and always have only one way to get it right. We saw this piece of code because uh, in, in the company that we are trying to set up, we had to integrate with uh, 29 different insurance companies with all kinds of different protocols. And we interfaced a method called uh, you know, connect or open. But uh, there were so many different types of configurations that the structs had become insane. So instead of trying to just uh, uh, you know, bloat the code, we actually started using functional options, and it worked. Interestingly, if you look at the, the dates on, on, on Rob Pikes and, uh, and Dave Cheney's posts, this is that old. I strongly recommend you all to have a look at these things, because, uh, in fact, Rob Pikes' post is awesome. It takes this to an entirely new level where I've just manipulated it. But your question could probably also be, hey, man, uh, you know what, I don't want these constants. So effectively, I'm setting the defaults here. Imagine this function returning a function which gets executed later on by the methods that I have said earlier, by the parameters. So th that, that blog post actually deals a lot into this. Have I thoroughly confused at least a few of y'all? 
That I take as a yes. <laughs> All right. Continue. OK. <clears throat> I'll explain this stuff here first. <laughs> I have a string, a JSON string, which I'm trying to unmarshal into this particular struct called superhero. That struct does not have anything other than an interface in it. But this interface is implemented by these kind of structs. Should I repeat what repeat just what I explained? This is the question before even I ask for the answer. Should it work? In other words, wouldn't it be cool if just by manipulating the JSON data, I could get different types of superheroes instantiated? All right, let's have some fun first. Then we'll come back. Here's the code. Here's the code. I have a superhero struct which has the powers interface. And just a caveat, usually when you define an interface, you always have ending with ER or OR. But in this case, it just didn't make sense. Power is already there. So I just put it as powers. Uh, I have Iron Man, and I have Thanos. And I'm just going to unmarshal the data. I'm going to unmarshal the data here. Should this work? Uh, for example, this is the in implementation of Iron Man and Thanos here. OK? So I've implemented the method. It should print Iron Man if it's Iron Man and Thanos if it's Thanos. All I'm going to do now is, uh, is Iron Man immortal? Nah, he died, right? In Endgame. <laughs> <laughs> Spider. <laughs> Can he fly? Yeah, and uh, he's super fast, all right. And I don't care about super strength because it's not there in the struct. Well, let's see what happens. I haven't changed any code. Let's see if, uh, is Thanos immortal? Sort of, let's, let's make him immortal. Yeah, he was, wasn't he? Uh, can he fly? So I'll just make that false. And I think he has super strength. So here, what I've done is I've just changed the, the data in a string. And I'm running the code again. What did I do? <laughs> right. If, I'm sure you know the answer. Hold on. And you already got yourself a t-shirt. <laughs> Hold on, but that's cool. Ah, oh, yeah, cool, don't worry. I don't have any t-shirts, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what did I do? We have one person in the audience, I'm sure he knows the answer. Yes? The problem is, that if I try to uh, run this code as is, I will get this error, which is absolutely right. I cannot unmarshal some random string into some interface because it's just too complicated. Isn't this too freaking complicated? Go agrees, the compiler agrees. Hey, dude, don't do these things. So this is the error you will get. But damn, the code did run, didn't it? <laughs> The key. So there is this method called unmarshal JSON, which you can call on any receiver. In this particular case, the superhero pointer. And you can put in any kind of logic. And here you will see the struct that I've taken as a, as a map. And I'm actually instantiating those particular structs to the right interfaces. Simple and smooth. But the key was here is unmarshal JSON, which is right below in that code which I don't show. 
Ah, wow, what the hell? Because I, <laughs> you see, I have a WTF hero there too. <laughs> because there are chances that uh, I might not, I might not have one of these views, right? So, uh, coming to the last part. Uh, well, this is something we actually found out when we were looking one of our projects for a uh, security project. Uh, how many of you all have heard of Dex or worked with Dex? Right. So Dex is like an open ID, you know, uh, conf uh, open ID connect federated provider, where we had to go through a lot of different kinds of connectors, and uh, this uses this technique of using a configuration which returns a function to try and open an interface. And then we had to drill that down. And the last impossible code, uh, there is, this is the main function. There is uh, no weight groups. There are no channels. What happens? And a t-shirt of four grabs, the non-existent one. Same code. I'm going to run it. This code hangs. Sorry? So the, I will change this a little bit. I will change this to seven go routines, not eight. I've changed it to seven go routines. This should give you the clue, this should give you the clue of why this exists. Uh, here's the, the other cool part. I'm keeping it back to eight. And I'm just putting a printf there. So it'll run for some time, but exit after some time. Uh, this was, this bit us in the butt a lot when we were, uh, so this is the reason why, because go routines are unlike most uh, preemptive garbage collectors and preemptive threads, go routines run. If you're giving it a compute, it will run and it will occupy the core. It will occupy the processor there. And I have, uh, because there are eight processors on this machine, eight go routines can occupy your processor and completely make it unusable. These are the only cases where uh, a go routine will actually switch context. Uh, we had done this in, a, in one of our uh, projects where we had a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino coming together, trying to figure things out. Right? Uh, and the, by the way, that's a, that's a vinyl player without a pivot. It's uh, running on <laughs> microcontrollers. And I'd love to talk about that, maybe give a demonstration sometime. But I've already, I already see Mark there. And he's promised me that he's going to come on stage and kick me out. Yeah, man. Come on, Mark. You know why? You know why? Because as part of entrepreneurship, you have to remember that, you know, it's for life. Guys, enjoy yourself. Sometimes even take a break. <laughs> right? And uh, I don't know how many of you all can do it, but try to retire by 40. <laughs> retire by 40, guys. And it's, it's just easy because uh, at that age, then you can probably do what you want. Uh, you code because you want to, not because you have to. Uh, you, I love to travel, I love to talk, and I get to get Mark and me fight on stage. So have fun around that. Well, before I go, and last slide after this, I am, uh, this talk is about impossible stuff. So this particular case, I'm actually going to do the impossible and not say thank you.